Let's turn to the book of Jeremiah, right after Isaiah in the Old Testament, chapter 2. I just want to read one verse that's going to lead off. We cover a lot of scripture today. But I am cognizant of the fact that the intention span of people today is about nine seconds. <laughs> so, about the attention span of a goldfish. You ever see goldfish in the... <laughs> so we'll be quick. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 4 Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 I'm sorry chapter 1 verse 5 the word of the Lord came to me saying before I formed you in the womb I knew you before you were born I set you apart I appointed you as a prophet to the nations don't read over that too quickly. Understand the order. Look at the, notice the order here. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart and as a prophet to the nations. So the first thing is purpose. Personality follows purpose and that precedes physical being. So we were tailor-made to purpose, every one of us. So knowing who we are is very important. It's tied to our destiny. Extremely, it's very important to know who you are. Would, would everybody agree with that? Now, I know there, there are two Australian sailors I know for certain who would agree with that. They were on leave in London and wandered into a famous England pub. And in the course of their social activity, they, were, they drank way too much. And when they left the pub, the famous Lon London fog had kind of settled over and they, they were wandering aimlessly through the streets of London and then bumped into a, a, a British naval officer, medals across his chest. And they said, hey, mate, do you know where we are? And the British officer was a little taken back by these two sailors approaching him so casually. And he... <clears throat> He said, do you know who I am? And the one said to his fellow, blimey, Mike, we're really in trouble now. We don't know where we are, and you don't know who he is. <laughs> <laughs> so knowing, knowing who we are, very important. We just finished celebrating Independence Day. And I have to say that a lot of that stuff just rang hollow with me. Because at one time, I think we used to know who we were as a nation. But I'm not sure we know who we are anymore. And before the 1960s, there were certain core values that, as Americans, we shared whether we were Republican or Democrat or something in between. Morality. Sanctity of life. Absolute truth. Definition of the family, what the family means. The importance of virtue and character in our leaders. Those were shared among Americans 
regardless of your political stripe, those were common values that we shared. And we were united, a United States of America. Land of the free, home of the brave. We've, we've heard that all our lives. Land of the free, but are we really free? And what do we mean by freedom? And will it last? Very important questions to ask ourselves, especially on, in the wake of just having celebrated Independence Day. You know, the, the 60s were a time of pulling down fences And when you see a fence up there, you see a fence, you're crossing a pasture and you see a fence. Before you try to tear that fence down, what's the first question you need to ask yourself? Why is it there? What's the fence there for? And don't think that you can hop that fence and think that that raging bull who's pawing the ground with his horns aimed at you is going to spare you because you're a vegetarian. <laughs> when you tear down fences, the first thing you need to ask yourself is what was the fence there for to begin with? So in the 60s, we started tearing down fences, fences regarding sexual morality. We didn't ask ourselves the question, what was the fence there for to begin with? Fences, rules, laws are there for a reason, for our benefit. Can you imagine trying to drive on 81 with no speed limits, no lines in the middle, no median stripe, just one big road, anyone just traveling any side of the road they wanted to, no, no yellow line in the middle, no double line. Can you imagine trying to drive anywhere with no rules or regulation? You ever been to the Grand Canyon? Who's, who's seen the Grand Canyon? Isn't that a magnificent, deep canyon? You know how deep it is? How deep is the Grand Canyon? 6,000 feet deep. Long way to fall. When you go into the north rim, you'll find these guardrails all the way around these very, these very sharp, jutting peninsulas of land into the Grand Canyon. And those guardrails are there to keep us miserable. Is that why they're there? Are those guardrails put up to, to make life hard for us? They're there for our benefit. So we don't fall over and plummet 6,000 feet to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. God's laws are there for the same reason. When God's laws about sexual morality were there for a reason. And we paid the price. We saw venereal disease rise. We saw unwanted pregnancies rise. And that led to the next fence we pulled down, the sanctity of life. And then Roe v. Wade happened in 1973, and then there was legalized abortion on demand. That was a consequence of pulling down the fence of sexual morality. Then we began to pull down fences regarding the definition of family, and pulling down fences regarding absolute truth. And now we find ourselves in a nation that is divided on the very thing that used to unite us. You know, winning freedom back in, in, the, in the Revolutionary War, from, which went from 1976 to 19... It was five years, so 1981. 1781. 
1776 to 1781, five years of Revolutionary War. But in, in spite of the blood, sweat, and tears that cost the Revolutionary War, winning freedom was nowhere as hard as ordering freedom. And the paradox of freedom is this, the very enemy of freedom is freedom itself, especially if there's no self-restraint. It took, it, it took another eight years to ratify the Articles of Confederation, to have a constitution to order freedom. And ordering freedom had to take into account the nature of man. That's why we have checks and balances in our system. It's one of the, it's one of the, fewest, it's one of the few democracies in history that has taken into account the nature of man because it was founded on the Christian view of man, the Judeo-Christian view of man that we are fallen, that, man, that men are not angels, men are not basically good. Men have to have checks and balances. And that's why it lasted. We were one nation under God. That's what united us. That's where e pluribus unum comes from. It is not possible any other way. One nation under God. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. And endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Certain inalienable. That means unimpeachable. That means inviolate. Unlike in Britain where you were born to class, in America, your destiny is not determined by who your daddy is. Because all men are created equal. And that is only possible, that, that, that view of man is only possible when you look through the worldview of Christianity. There is no other worldview on the planet that sees men made in the image of God. None. Christianity is, uh, alone stands head and shoulders above all the other belief systems, all the other worldviews that sees the intrinsic value of each man and woman. And that's what united, that's, that's what America was all about. America, what, is that, what does that word mean? How do we get our name? Why are we called America? Anybody? Somebody said, well, we got this new country. <laughs> we got to name it. <laughs> what, what do you say? What are we going to call it? Well, let's, let's, name, let's name it after the map maker, Amerigo Vespucci. Well, what's his name mean, Amerigo? Why are we going to name a country Amerigo? Amerigo means home ruler. So it was almost prophetic that a man named Amerigo Vespucci, Vespucci would map out this country whose very name means home ruler. And the thing that characterizes America among all the other nations in the world is that we believe in home rule, not being ruled by a colonial or an ocean away. That we rule ourselves. That's what it means. But to rule ourselves, to be free in that way, it is understood that the citizens of that country are already under a higher law. Otherwise, the system doesn't work. Let me read you what President John Adams... Anybody know who John Adams is? Who's John Adams? And I'm not talking about the, the attorney general that's running in Virginia. Huh? Right. And not the beer. <laughs> Who is John Adams? Uh, 
At least you knew he was a president. <laughs> Second president. This is what John Adams said. We have no government armed in power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. Our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the government of any other. Did you all understand that? Let me read it again. We have no government armed in power, power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by morality and religion. If there's no self-restraint, this doesn't work. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. And that's why the prophecies of Professor Alexander Twitler. Anybody know who Alexander Titler was? I didn't either. I had to look him up on Google. And he, is the, he will be remembered for this quote in his prophetic. He said that democracy is always temporary in nature. It simply cannot exist as a permanent form of government. A democracy will continue to exist up until the time that voters discover that they can vote themselves generous gifts from the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidates who promise the most benefits from the public treasury, with the result that every democracy will finally collapse due to loose fiscal policy, which is always followed by a dictatorship. The average age of the world's greatest civilizations from the beginning of history has been about 200 years. How old is America? Almost, uh, almost 220 years. So we had a good run. But our expir expiration date is coming up. During those 200 years, these nations always progressed through the following sequence. From bondage to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to great courage, from courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to complacency, from complacency to apathy, from apathy to dependency, and from dependency back to bondage. And this is from a professor of antiquity who studied history. He studied all the great democracies, and there have only been a few, really, throughout the history of the world. So the key is as hard as it was to win freedom and as hard as it was to order freedom, it's harder yet to sustain freedom. How do we keep freedom alive? How do we keep freedom going? Brother Os Guinness talks about the triangle of freedom. We've talked about the triangle of freedom here in the discipleship class. But freedom requires virtue, as we just talked about in, in that quote from John Adams. Freedom requires virtue. Virtue requires faith. And faith requires freedom, which requires virtue, which requires faith, which, is, which requires freedom, which requires virtue, which requires faith, which requires freedom, which requires virtue, virtue which requires, faith. which requires, freedom. which requires, virtue. which requires, faith. which requires, freedom. which requires, virtue. which requires, faith. which requires, freedom. you got it. That's how freedom gets sustained. So knowing who we are is extremely important as a nation. Anybody ever see the movie The Born Identity? You don't have to be ashamed. Raise your hand if you've seen the movie. What's that movie about? C. 
secret agent who, for, who forgets who he is. Complete, he, has these, he has these skills that he doesn't know how he, how he came by them. He has these certain abilities, but he doesn't know who he is. You see, identity is tied to our destiny and tied to our reason for being here. And in some ways, America is like that. We've lost our identity. We have these gifts, we have these abilities, and we don't know how to put it together because we've, we've forgotten who we are. We've forgotten who we are. That's true for nations, it's true for the people of God, and it's true for individuals. The people of God have forgotten why we're here. We are not here to have a party on Sunday mornings. That is not the only reason we're here. In fact, the majority of the reason for our being is on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. That's why we're here. Jesus said, you are light and you are salt. What happens when the light is hidden under a bushel? What happens when the salt loses its flavor? When we lose our identity, when we forget who we are, then purposes get frustrated. What is the purpose of the believers here? Why are we here? Why are you and I here? Who are we? Who are we? Anybody? Well, it sure took a long time to say that. If somebody asked you your name, would you hesitate as long? What's your name? Well, I'm, a, I'm a, uh, Chuck. <laughs> Who are we? Why are we here? Once we know who we are, then that dictates our priorities. That dictates what comes first. We have to know why we're here. Otherwise, we, we have no goal. You know, I want you, to, I want you to look at the life of a man who knew where he was going. He knew, he knew who he was long before there was anything in writing. Turn to Genesis. Chapter 39. And I won't go through the whole story. I would encourage you all to read the whole story of Joseph. I just want to focus on this one aspect in his life. To show you what a free man looks like. A free man who, hundreds of years before the Ten Commandments were ever written down, he knew, he knew what pleased God and what didn't please God. He knew who he was in, in, in God. And you know the story Joseph was sold into slavery by his own brothers. He rose in favor even in the house in which he was a slave. And his master, who just happened to be the captain of the guards in Egypt, promoted him to run his entire household. He trusted him that much. And that's what it says right in verse 4. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care with Joseph in charge. 
He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. That was subtle. But he refused. But he refused. Three beautiful words. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. And no one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? You see where he staked his morality? Not on situational ethics that we are so accustomed to in this country and in, in the world in which we live. It's not, you know, what if we get caught? It's not as if Potiphar's wife said, well, you know, Potiphar doesn't care. He has his mistress. He lets me do what I want. It's not, it's not it, it had nothing to do with any of that. He says, how can I do this thing and sin against God? That's where he staked his morality. Because we live in a moral universe that's built on spiritual reality. And it's unchanging. There is such a thing as absolute truth. When we're anchored there, then we don't come into situational ethics that, that sway with the, with the breeze, that shift like the sand. An example would be the, the rich man who, who took the, uh, that plane ride, uh, long transatlantic plane ride, obviously wealthy, this, all his clothing, you know, diamond cufflinks, you know, Armani suit. I mean, he was just decked. He just, just oozed money. He sat down next to a very attractive woman. And they struck up a conversation. And in the course of the conversation, he happened to ask her, he said, if I were to give you a million dollars, would you go to bed with me? She said, a million dollars? U.S.? Yeah. <laughs> a million dollars? Yeah. She said, she said, oh, okay. He said, would you go to bed with me for $50? She said, 50? What kind of woman do you think I am? <laughs> he said, we've already established that. Now we're just haggling over the price. Situational ethics. Like the, the mountain climbing team, the Mount, uh, Mount Everest, that was rescued by another team who happened to encounter them as they were running out of oxygen and, and, uh, and running out of food and water. And they were rescued by another team on their way to summit at Mount Everest. Mount Everest is the tallest summit in the world. The peak of Mount Everest is a cruising altitude of 747. That's how how high it is. And they were on their way up and they got rescued by another team that happened, happened along at the time. And then so they were allowed to summon and on their way down, a, a storm uh, system hit the mountain. And they saw another team that they could have helped, but they saved themselves and let the other team perish. The other team died. And when they got down to the bottom of the mountain at the base camp, the reporters who were aware of what was happening said, how could you let that team perish when you had the ability to help them? Then you, can, then you have some moral responsibility to help the other team? And the team leader said to the reporter, above 8,000 feet, there is no morality. Situational ethics. Ethics that shift with the circumstances. Yes, it's okay today, but it's not okay tomorrow. See, Joseph, Joseph didn't stake his claim on any situation. His, his morality was rooted and grounded in the character of God himself. How did he know what would please God? 
You know, we get, we get questions all the time. Those, in, those of us in ministry, those of us who counsel people, that we get questions like, can I do this and still be a Christian? You know, do you think, you think God of mind if I, you know, throw down a, a, a couple of wine chasers? Do you think God of mind if I go to see this movie? Or do you think God... What, what was in writing for Joseph? How did Joseph know what God would want? Well, he had the Ten Commandments. No, he didn't. Ten Commandments won't be written for many, many, many years. A whole generation, over 50 years later in the wilderness where the Ten Commandments were written. There were no commandments. There was nothing in writing. How did Joseph know? How did he know what would please God? How did he know? If it wasn't written down. How did he know? Hmm? There you go. If you have a relationship with somebody, long going, enduring relationship with somebody, you know intuitively what will please them and what won't. You know what their likes and their dislikes are. Joseph has such a relationship with God, the, the same God who gave him the dream of, of that one day he would be a ruler. This same God spoke to him about what his, shared his heart with him about what he liked, what he didn't like. See, salt and light, that's what we are. Joseph was a free man, even though he ended up in prison, even though he was a slave in Potiphar's household, he was a free man because he staked his life, his morality, he staked it all on the character of God. And we look today and we ask for, where are the men in the church? There was a recent poll done by men of integrity. And they discovered that there, there are six, 68% of men in church today regularly view pornography. 66, that's more than two-thirds. That's two out of three men are, will go to church having just been on the internet seeing and seeing viewed pornography the night before. Can you imagine the paralysis that creeps into the church when the shame and guilt of all that paralyzes men from stepping up? Because the burden of that guilt and that shame hinders them, paralyzes them from doing anything for the kingdom of God. And this is salt and light in this generation. We've forgotten who we are. We've forgotten who we are. Jesus knew who he was. Joseph knew who he was. Jesus said when, when, when he was confronted by Pontius Pilate, he said, for this cause I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. And those that are on the side of truth hear my voice. He knew. He always knew what it was about. And that governed his decision making, that governed his choices, that governed everything he did. We have to know who we are if we're going to know where we're going and why we're here. When ships set sail, there are three things that they have to, they have to master. One, they have to know what to do to keep the ship from sinking. Two, they have to know how to avoid colliding into other ships. And three, they need to know why they went to sail, why they're sailing on the seas to begin with, why they're out there. The first, the first is descriptive of personal ethics, like we just talked about with Joseph. The second is descriptive of social ethics, how we interact with other people. But the third and most important is normative ethics, why we are doing what we're doing. Why are we here to begin with? And that comes from knowing who we are. Jeremiah, and we go back to our original 
Scripture, Jeremiah said, before I was formed, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Purpose was first. Personality was shaped around that purpose even before his physical being was formed. What was true for Jeremiah is true for you and me. We were shaped, you and I, around God's purpose for our lives. No one here, not before or since, has ever been an accident of evolution. You are not an accident, and I don't care what they teach you in school. God's word supersedes any teacher's interpretation of how we came to be. Made for a purpose. And everybody in their heart of hearts knows that. The high rate of suicide in these days is testimony to what happens when you take purpose away from young people. They know in their heart of hearts that life has meaning. There is a meaning to, for our being here. There's no one here who has some meaningless life. But if you listen to what's being taught and they, have no, and, and they, have, they hear no alternative, it leads them to despair. And the two things young people come for, for counseling these days, the number one is addiction to pornography. And that's not just men. It's, men, it's, it's young men and young women addicted to pornography. The second is suicide. Young people with ostensibly so much to live for are considering of taking themselves out because they have found no meaning in spite and we're not talking about poor people we're talking about people who are on the rich, rich cusp of society where supposedly they have everything your heart could desire and they have found no meaning even when they lay hold of everything people say they need to lay hold of because we'll never be satisfied until we're, we satisfy the will of God in our life. When we are walking in the will of God in our lives, we are, being, we are doing what we were born to do. When we are doing what we're born to do, life does not get better than that. That is where, that is where life is the richest and the fullest when we're in the middle of the will of God for our lives. When we're doing what we were born to do born to do. Psalm 16. We'll close with this. My nine seconds is up. I'm glad that you all have a greater attention span than the goldfish. Last verse of Psalm 16, verse 11. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. You know, the thing that, is, that has led to the undoing of so many is the pursuit of pleasure. But there are no pleasures that come anywhere close to the pleasure that we have at the right hand of God. Doing what we were born to do, life does not get better than that. Let's bow our heads. Jimbo. Who are we? Who are we as a people? Who are we as, an, as the people of God? Who are we as believers? Are we truly light and salt? Who are we? 
As you bow your heads t- today, I want you to just, I want you to think about, Lord, am I being light? Am I, am I truly salt where I live, where I work? Lord, I was nothing and no one until you found me and redeemed me by your grace and your precious blood. Help me to use the days that I have left, God, for your glory. Because I am nothing and no one right now, God. And anything that I do for time and eternity will be what I do for you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Who am I that the Lord of all the earth would choose to know my name, would choose to feel my hurt? Who am I, bright and morning star, choose to light the way of my ever-wandering heart? It's not because of who I am, but because of who you are. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow, wave tossed in the ocean. A vapor in the wind, still you hear me when I'm calling. Lord, you catch me when I'm falling. You told me who I am. I am yours. I am yours. I am yours. Who am I that the eye that sees my sin should look on me with love and watch me rise again? Who am I that the voice that calms the sea would call out through the way? Calm the storm in me. It's not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. It's not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading. Here today and gone tomorrow, wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind, still you hear me when I'm calling, Lord you catch me when I'm falling, and told me who I am, I am yours. 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 Don't ever forget who you are, who you belong to. Because your character and your destiny are tied together. You are light. You are salt. 
And I have it on the highest authority. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. So be light. Be salt. And this generation live as free men and women. Free men and women who are slaves to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Restrained by love for Him and all we do. Not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind in Christ Jesus. I am a flower quickly fading here today and gone tomorrow wave tossed in the ocean a vapor in the wind still you hear me when I'm calling Lord you catch me when I'm falling you told me who I am I am yours, I am yours, I am yours, I am to the king of kings you are a masterpiece because you are a piece of the master Lord bless you keep you make his face to shine upon you and give you peace God bless you